Hello. So, uh, I'm Chris Leach. I'm at Red Hat. I don't have any slides. I just kind of wanted to talk a bit and then uh, throw some questions out to the group uh, regarding uh, some questions that came to me from the investigation I've done into it and, and where I'm at with that so far. Uh, so, I work uh, primarily on uh, network transport storage drivers, so uh, iSCSI, FCOE, uh, getting into NVMe, TCP now. Uh, a while back, uh, it was brought to my attention that people were attempting to run the control plane for iSCSI and run the user space packages uh, in containers, uh, and it didn't work, and they wanted to know why. Um, so as I started looking into it, uh, the answer mostly turned out to be the interaction uh, between those transport drivers and network namespaces. So um, in a lot of cases, just telling the people trying to do that that there was an issue and you needed to stay, if, if you're creating a container, um, you have to set it for the privileged uh, network which leaves you in the initial namespace uh, resolve the issue enough. Um, so no one's really beating down my door over it, but it's not the best situation, right? So the question is, can you then, how important is it to have the ability to have a separate network namespace and attach to storage resources uh, in that? So. As I investigated this for our iSCSI drivers, um, it was a variety of problems around the transport objects and the uh, interface between the control tools uh, in user space and the kernel. Um, so the iSCSI control interface is uh, pretty complicated. Um, we've really split things out quite a bit there, so uh, the, the very first thing that was failing were uh, the Netlink control interface just didn't work outside of the initial namespace. So that was easy enough. Went in, patched some things up, made it listen per namespace. You could get things working. Um, but then if you're going to isolate based on networks, you potentially want to connect to storage from multiple networks and trying to run multiple instances of the, uh, the control processes with iSCSI D then completely blew up because uh, they could see the other transport objects um, that were outside of their network isolation and didn't like that at all. <laughs> there was a lot of conflict. Uh, between having competing processes. So continue down the path of, okay, I s allow per network control interfaces, then start isolating all of the transport objects into each of those network namespaces, and then that turns into uh, SysFS filtering on visibility of all the transport objects. And so I kind of drew a line between you know, the transport objects and the actual storage objects in the data plane. Um, and that works. And you can have separate control and connections to network connected storage. And then all of the storage itself just shows up on the system and is not filtered or isolated because we don't do block namespaces. So, um, more recently, I've, I've kind of gone back and revisited that and tried to compare and see how we do with other network transport storage. So I tried it out with NVMe TCP, where we have a much simpler uh, interface to the control processes. There's just a character device that gets used. Um, it works because when you establish a connection, uh, it just uses whatever namespace you're running NVMe CLI in, so you can establish connections from different network namespaces. Once they're established, you can 
list them, control them, and destroy them from any namespace as long as you have the control character device. So it's not really filtered out. Um, I went and took a look at the code for Fiber Channel over Ethernet. Uh, the software driver there explicitly checks for the initial namespace so it won't work in uh, isolated namespaces at all. Um, that then there's some other things that I don't work with, but I poked at the code just to take a look at. Um, the ATA over Ethernet, uh, distributed block drive, device drivers, uh, all have explicit references to the initial network namespace. So there doesn't seem to be a network connected storage transport that will let you uh, containerize its control and connect through different network namespaces. So I guess the, the questions that I had for discussion were um, how much of a use case is this? Because it, it, it feels like something that could be worked on um, a bit further. And then the stopping point of where I, I was at with the patches and the problems that I ran into mostly were edge cases around uh, namespace lifetimes, which I'm not entirely sure how to approach or go about because uh, the namespaces tend to be attached to processes. And when we have storage transport connections maintained in the kernel that aren't attached to a process lifetime, um, how do you maintain the namespaces if there's no more running processes in them? I can tell you how to do that. We can actually mount the NFS file system in the uh, standard base file system. So that allows you to exit the container while keeping its namespace alive, and then you can re-enter that namespace. So if you tie storage to the namespace, you can use that mechanism to preserve it. And probably if we're starting at something in the kernel, we should actually automatically do that. Okay. And you, uh, um, yeah, because um, I'd, I'd seen how some of the, the networking tools do that to, a, to, to keep a reference into the namespace in the file system. Um, but I, don't know, I, I guess I was worried about leaving um, persistent things in the kernel if that was well, it is a problem. I mean, some way deletable. It doesn't go away until you unmount it, so you okay. don't have the lifetime of something that you have to manage rather than right. somebody else. But what, uh, what would happen if you restart that container? Um, would then, would it find the old namespace? Or would it create a new namespace? So it doesn't lead to some sort of... It creates a new namespace. By yeah, restarting the container, the you mean Namespace is deleted when the container is shut down. The, the question that I have is why isn't the lifetime of this... Like why are you not taking a reference on the relevant namespaces when the connection is established? Why is there a lifetime issue in the first place? I'm really just trying to understand. Because no one was aware that there is a namespace. As you just said, I mean, none of the um, network storage implementations have any truck with namespaces. They literally try to avoid it. And I mean, as you just said, all the others have an expert to check whether we are in the initial namespace or not. And NiceGuys is the only one which does not have a check. Mm -hmm. But that is not because it was a deliberate choice, it's just because no one did. And consequently, as they are not aware of namespace, they wouldn't be taking reference on the, na on the namespace, as they would know that they have to take a reference on the namespace. I, I think the problem is not uh, why is it broken. The question is how do we make it work? Because nobody's ever tried to make it work. Before. Yeah, I mean, but my, my answer was then basically just we should probably take a reference to the relevant uh, namespaces. I mean, I'm ha I, this is the first time, for example, I hear about these issues. But if you loop us into the patches and so on, we can certainly help with that and review and comment on it and so on and help you with this. I'm happy to. Um, can, can you remind me what exactly would happen? So if we have this setup that we have a, a container who is creating a namespace aware iSCSI block device, the, then which the block device then takes a reference on that namespace. 
Then I shut down that container and restart it. I will get a new namespace. What will I still be able to access the iSCSI device in that old namespace? Well, that, I mean, that that's more of an issue for, you know, the, the user space concept of a container, right? I mean, if, if we're gonna isolate it by namespace and you're talking about restarting and returning, then you have to be returning to the same wait, wait, namespace. You're getting confused about your control plane. If the block device takes a reference on the namespace, that namespace cannot go away until the block device relinquishes until you drop yes. the reference. Yes, I know, I know. But that the, I know that the you don't have to do it like that. You can also manually spawn something that forces the block device to create, and that would tie the lifetime of this, whatever this thing is, to the namespace. When you kill the namespace, it would probably kill the device. I mean, there, there are different yeah. ways around you could do it. The question is, what do you want to do? Indeed. That's the question. What is it we want to do? And I guess it's not something we can decide or for which there is a golden rule because it really depends on what you want to do with that. What is your use case and what do you want to achieve with that container? It's perfectly feasible that you have a container which just want to create, wants to create an iSCSI device, does something with it and delete the iSCSI device on shutdown. It's also feasible that there, is, that there is a container which provides an iSCSI device which should be either accessible to other containers or should be stay around even yeah. across restarts of the container. If How would we know? If we look at, uh, well, if we look at this from a networking perspective, from networking devices, right? If you, uh, if you, for example, create a network device, a VET device, right? And you move it into the container, you're switching its network namespace when, when you do this. And so at this moment, when the network namespace is switched, uh, the lifetime of this VET device, uh, of this what, uh, virtual uh, device, is tied to the lifetime of the container. So when the container uh, uh, of gets the shut container down. container or the namespace? Uh, the namespace, the network namespace, uh, sorry. Container, set of namespaces, I'm talking about separate network namespace. Um, is tied to the lifetime of the network namespace, which is tied to the lifetime of PID1 or whatever it is in your container. And when the container shuts down uh, or the network namespace is destroyed, then the VET device is automatically uh, cleaned up. So uh, that's one model you could, for example, implement uh, these virtual iSCSI devices, I guess. So that's okay. then you tie the lifetime of the iSCSI device to uh, the lifetime of the network namespace or the container in general. That, yeah, and that, that does work. If, if you're not worried about the connection going away, I, well, no, but he's. No, no, there's well, something that has to happen. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure whether it's a feasible thing because um, Really, iSCSI only looks at the, at the IP address. It couldn't care less which device this IP address is on. And um, so if we were to go with the VATH approach, um, we would need to provide an IP address to that one. And I'm not sure whether we have an additional IP address or a group of... In general, it's a good idea, yeah, clearly, to tie it to a virtual device which is tied to the namespace, and if the namespace the goes away, the, the interface goes away. That's exactly. The, the, the point that I wanted to make with this is um, <coughs> somewhat to James's point. Um, you, you can have a model where you tie a device lifetime to a namespace, but it's also not, it's not impossible, it's not unheard of, and it's doable to tie... Uh, to t essentially let the device that you're interested in determine the lifetime of the namespace. So when you destroy the device, the device, then you get a put on the namespace as well and you destroy the namespace. So in this manner, you could, for example, persist a namespace implicitly through the device. It wouldn't be reachable from the user space anymore if all of the processes that are attached to that namespace uh, have died, uh, but that's also a model. Well, but how would you tear down such a thing? Yeah, exactly. Then you need an explicit destroy operation. It's always better. Well, and that destroy operation needs to it needs to be able to access the namespace because we need to talk by net, uh, netlink to that namespace. And if it can't, we can't destroy it. Well, pretty much every lifetime tends to be tied to the lifetime of the, the, the namespace. When the yeah, namespace I mean, dies, we want everything to go. That's the easiest. Uh, that's the easiest model. So. Or you need a separate operation from user space where you, for example, say destroy this device. Can I just poke on one thing you said? You said you didn't have multiple IP addresses. Usually we assign well, no, 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 that IP was wrong. You will have, you know, uh, forget it. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Uh, uh, can 
question is something on this. Sure. Uh, we actually have, um, have a use case. Uh, uh, we implement uh, the CSI specification for Kubernetes, where the, um, there's a container running uh, on each node. And this container creates uh, uh, NFS or BRBT devices. Uh, I guess iSCSI could be a use case too. And we want the, the device to, to persist to live across container restarts. The container might get killed for various reasons, but we want the device to persist because it's consumed by, <coughs> by other pods, by other containers. And uh, yes, uh, tearing down the device after you lose the namespace is a problem, and uh, for NFS, we have worked around this by using the initial namespace. Yeah, so that's the only one you can do, because that, uh, uh, you need to be able to reach that namespace from other containers, and a re container restart to all intents and purposes is another container. So, and, and as Christian just said, that um, once you tear down the container who created the namespace in the first place, there is no way how we could reach that na namespace ever again, even though it's still around. Yeah. If we were able to reconnect, or if we were able to specify, please reconnect to that namespace, that things would be different, but I don't think we can. Uh, can I we? mean, um, yes, that works, but this is a user space, uh, this is a user space problem, user space concept. Like, for example, let's say um, you, uh, you shut down your container, uh, you, you create a container, and then you bind mount the namespace file descriptor for the network namespace. Oh, sorry, may maybe I should go into a little more detail. What I mean by this, so and, uh, the NSFS file system that he was talking about. If you create a new namespace, all namespaces are reachable, reachable from slash proc pid of the process, then slash ns, and then slash, and there's a list of all of the namespaces that the process belongs to. So you can also compare namespaces and so on. So when you create a container, then the PID of this, um, uh, this path for the containers init process, for example, proc PID nsnet, opening that, taking an FD out and bind mounting it to somewhere will persist that namespace. Meaning if you now shut down the container, all of the processes go away, all of the non-persisted namespaces go away, but since you still have an open FD to the network namespace of the container, the network namespace is still alive. Now, if you wanted to do this, you could restart a container, create it with a bunch of namespaces in the correct order, it's a bit complicated, but it works, and then do a set NS for the init process of the container and move the uh, init process of the container into the same network namespace that the previous container had. <laughs> so that is yeah. possible. It's just a, you know, it's just a programming uh, programming problem. But it is in principle possible. So. Uh, okay. Yeah. Obvious. Yeah. Yeah. Ob I, yeah. But can we poke on the use case? Because you said you were exporting a service from this container. So it sounds like the service isn't confined to the container. You want other containers to consume the service that this is exporting. Yeah. So the mount point. Yes, uh, we're actually, um, we are doing the, the NFS mount in the container, and then we bind mount this to, to other containers. Right, so effectively this is a containerized control plane because other containers need to be able to, so, so you, can't, you, you can't confine the mount namespace to this because it has to be globally visible. So this isn't really a properly containerized thing. If you're using a container artificially to get an IP address to this thing, but the daemon itself has the root mount, mount namespace visible, which then makes everything else visible in view, so if you have a path from other containers, you can get to the storage. Um, yes, if I, if I understood you correct, yes. That's uh, the, um, I think that's the model of the, that architecture of uh, the container storage interface. You, you do the mount, and then you bind mount this to, to other containers, so they have access. Uh, we're using bidirectional mounts to, to make this work. So we, we could give you a more containerized model, which is where you actually do spawn a mount namespace from this container. And then everything is confined to that mount namespace. Any container that wants to use that mount point would have to have its own mount namespace coming off this. So you could then do the bind mount downwards, but it wouldn't be visible upwards. That would be the more containerized case, because that's sort of properly contained to a namespace hierarchy. Yes, yes, that would be better. Uh, and in, in general, uh, for example, with uh, BRBD, it doesn't support it uh, at all. Uh, it uh, uses the init namespace. So uh, it would be nice if uh, it was possible for network devices to, uh, to, um, to be really containerized. Well, then we get into the problem that NFS is easy because it's just the mount point. So the mount namespace confines it. 
uh, iSCSI is a block device which is not confined by the map namespace. Interesting. Which is the next block. Let's talk about Def Tempest. Why would we want to talk about DevTemp? Uh, in, in a sense, because all of the right, block okay, devices so show up there. <laughs> yeah, okay. I mean, this is then is, is essentially the next topic which I want, or which we actually wanted to bring up, that is namely block namespaces, because um, the main reason why most of the, or basically or nearly all of the um, network storage um, drivers touch upon the in initial namespace is because it's not possible to only to restrict the view of user space to which block devices are there. Y yes, it is. It's you use the device C group for that, if you want. It doesn't operate the same way as a namespace does. No, but it you can certainly remove visibility of devices and add them to a container. But that's a that's sort of more of an access restriction. I think what he, yeah. for example, is, is yeah. really uh, talking about if you uh, if you create a new block device or uh, yeah, if you create a new block device, where which will it show up in DevTemper? Yes, on the host. And all of them will show up on the host, loop devices and so on. And that is a, I, that has been a problem we have been struggling with for uh, for a while. It's yeah. really, uh, uh, it's really annoying. Yeah. And uh, what's more, it's a uh, temper is only just the, uh, well, a symptom really, because um, we have a single list of well uh, major minor numbers, yeah. which is accessible to each and every process. So yes. if you have the major minor number, you can open the device. Full stop. Whether it shows up, def whether we restrict the visibility, def tempers by C group, whatnot, doesn't come into it. So, what ha really? Hannes, do you yeah. just want to come up here and move into the next topic then? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, yep, I think. Uh, if we're done with this, um, Chris, Sorry, say. It was I, I think that's okay for now. We can well, okay. talk to other people about this to continue. Yeah, thank you.